get to it. Amen. You may be seated. So good to see you today. You're looking great. You really are. <laughs> Some of you are not quite sure. Tell the person beside you, say, you look great today too. All right. We've been uh, in a series probably for seven or eight weeks that we went through talking about the end times and prophecy. Last week we talked about a comparison between the first advent, that first coming of the Lord Jesus, and all those prophecies, how they were fulfilled in him. And then we talked about the prophecies regarding his second coming, from the, coronation, uh, from the incarnation to the coronation. So if you aren't here, I encourage you to go back and catch either one of our YouTube channel uh, uh, messages on that or on our Facebook. Either way, you, you can get that message. But I encourage you because it really gives you a clear understanding of just how, how true, how real, how marvelous, how wonderful the Word of God really is and how that when God says something, that settles it, all right? You may not believe it. I, I, I remember seeing a bumper sticker that said, you know, God said it, you know, I believe it. that settles it. Truth of the matter is, God said it. That pretty much settles it. No matter what I believe, it's still the truth. Amen? Now, if I want it to be the truth in my life, I'm going to have to believe it. And I'm going to have to embrace it myself. But I want to move into kind of, that was the first of several Christmas messages for the end of the season here. But uh, we'll move from that today. And again, that concluded that particular series on prophecy. And probably next year sometime we'll do another three or four part and cover some other aspects of the second coming. I believe it's important we talk about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ especially in a day and age when no one believes this is going to happen. We need to keep ringing that bell, amen, and reminding folks of the truth of God's Word. But I want to just look at one verse of Scripture today as we talk about the Word made flesh. And this is from John chapter 1, verse 14. And just focus on this one Scripture. All right, and John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, that's all pretty much John, as he's t starting up his gospel, records about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts in John 1.1, 1, 1, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, as he moves from there, now he comes down to verse 14, he says, And then the Word was made flesh. Now, I'm sure if you're one of the Greek philosophers of the day, or you're reading through John's writings here, and you look at those first verses, you might not squabble too much concerning, you know, that, that the, in the beginning was the Word, and God was that Word, you know. But when you get to verse 14, this is where those rationalists and even the mysticists would back off, or the atheists and the agnostics of our day back off. Excuse me, the Word was what? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That the actual Word of God the Son of glory, the only begotten of the Father, becomes flesh, becomes a man, and, and dwells among us. That's what we refer to, and a lot of people don't understand that terminology of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, but literally meaning he became a man. That God becomes a man, and he dwells among us. There's really three statements I want to look at from this passage. That first part, the Word was made flesh. The second part I want to look at is the Word dwelt among us. What does that really mean? And the third part, he was full of grace and full of truth, all right? So let's look at this first part of this verse where it says, and the word was made flesh. As I said, the Greek philosopher might have kind of gone along with this for a certain point, but he would never agree to this point that the word of God became flesh or became man, all right? Uh, it was just too much for him to comprehend. And still, a lot of people have, st have struggled with this whole issue right here that God really becomes a man. Many people just would believe that Jesus Christ is not really a Christ, a Messiah. And if at best he was, he was just a man and nothing more than just a man. But the Bible makes it clear that God sent more than just a man to save us from our sins. He sent his son and his son took on human form and became flesh. Literally the translation would read, the word was born flesh. That's it. The, I mean, just think about it. The word was born flesh. Turn, turn that over in your mind for just a moment. Here comes the great holy God out of all eternity, already known as the Ancient of Days. And he comes to Bethlehem, and he's born, this little baby, in time and in, in, and in space, the reality of God becomes flesh among us. In fact, John doesn't even really get in when he talks about the Christmas story, he doesn't get into a lot of this issue about Bethlehem and the Bethlehem story, although it's marvelous as we think about it. But in his thinking here, as he's talking about, and the word become flesh, this is way too big for a stable in Bethlehem. <laughs> Even though that's where he came, and that's how he was born, here he is, the Lord of glory, and, and he, he manifests himself. Now, to the rationalist and to the mysticist or to the philosopher, you know, <clears throat> they, they can't quite get that in, into their mind. 
you know, the, for the rationalist, it's, it's a little, you know, he, he, he wants to kind of bring God down to just kind of an object, or at least the Word of God to an object. To the mysticist, it's not anything that he can get his head around or his hands upon or seek to control, but understand that God is the God of all glory. Hebrews, when writing the book of Hebrews, the writer there uses this terminology in verse 1, he said, chapter 1 of verse 1, he says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. God give a word to the prophets. But he says, but in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his son. In other words, he's given us not a word to the prophets. He just gave his word to us in the form of his son. He comes to us and makes himself known. And ultimately, in real historical reality, God becomes flesh. He puts on human form, becomes a man, and comes to give us life and to pay the price ultimately for the price that none of us could pay, the price of our sins. Understand the Bible tells us multiple times over and over that everyone has sinned, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody. There's not one person who's entered in time and eternity other than Adam and Eve. They were not born in sin, but they entered into sin by choice. But because of their sin, we have all become sinners. All right? Now, I don't have to really convince most folks of that. I don't think many of you have too high opinion of yourself that you don't think you've ever sinned. If you do, it's time to humble yourself. But the idea is that you, because of what you were, you couldn't do what needed to be done to change you and to fit you for heaven and for a relationship with God. Sin ruined the whole thing. But God becomes a man. If I were to pay the price for my own sin, it's still insufficient. It's not an adequate sacrifice. Therefore, I have to spend eternity in hell because I'm a sinner. But God comes in the form of human mankind, born as son, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to this world. And remember what he said, I have come to seek and save that which was lost. You know, I came to give myself as a ransom for many. Over and over again, we see this, this offering and the sacrifice of this body of the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross and becoming our sin and paying the price that none of us could ever play, pay. He pays it there for us. You talk about a Christmas gift, that's incredible. Of the grace, the mercy, the glory, and the blessings of God. The Word of God was made flesh. The Word of God was born flesh. Please wrap your heart around that to some extent to realize the celebration of Christmas is far beyond what most people make of it. Here we have literally God invading time, space, and eternity to bring us what every one of us needs in the form of his son. He gives us that perfect lamb of God to pay the sacrifice, to pay the ultimate price for all of our sins. And the Bible says, and the word was made flesh. And then it goes on to say, and that word dwelt among us. The second statement's interesting. The kind of the succeeding clauses after that is talking about the Lord and his word that's given to us. And it gets kind of a, a reference to Exodus 33. I really believe this is what is in the heart and the mind of, of the apostle as the Holy Spirit is speaking this to him where he talks about a tent of meeting or tabernacle. Because literally this is what this word means when it says, and the word of God dwelt among us. It literally means he pitched his tent among us. Yeah. That's the terminology that's used. It's a word, skeno, which literally means to pitch a tent. And so what it's saying is the word came and dwelt. It, it pitched his tent. He became resident right among the rest of us, and he manifest his glory to us. The tent of meeting is making reference to the tabernacle. Later on, the temple. Remember the tent of meeting? We talked about the tabernacle. For those who've been a member of the church, you remember many years ago, I did like a 32-part series on the tabernacle. There was just so much there about the tabernacle, every part of it. In fact, it's given in great detail in the Old Testament how the tabernacle was to be constructed, how it was to be manufactured, how, what materials were to be made of, how that God even gifted those who would be the artisans, the engineers, and the architects of the Holy. It was all set out by God how it would be done. In every part, I mean from the ropes to the tents to, to the veils to the curtains to everything inside of it, all pointed to the fact that, you know, that there would be a tabernacle that would dwell with us and his name would be Jesus. Because every aspect of the Old Testament tabernacle speaks of redemption and grace and the presence of God. In fact, it was literally called the tent of meeting. That's what the word meant when, when it was given to us in the scriptures. It was the place where the Lord would manifest his glory, the cloud by day, the fire by night, and over it he would rest amongst the people of God. Moses would go to the tent of meeting and speak face to face. As a man, Bible says in Exodus 33, would speak with his friends. Moses would go and speak with the Lord the place where God would reside. It says he, he, he dwelt among us. This word dwelt is from, from a word, as I said, skinu, which literally has to do with a tent and putting a tent in the midst of other tents that were there. 
Now, the Bible tells us that we literally are tents. And Paul even made a reference in 2 Corinthians 5, says, we know that if this earthly tabernacle were dissolved, all right? So he's talking about our bodies. In fact, another place he makes reference to our body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we're not our own. We've been bought with God, so we glorify God in this tent, in this body. So, you know, you're, you're resident inside that body. That's really just your tent. That's not you. That's part of you, but that's not really you. There's more to any one of us than ever meets the eye. Now, God sees all of that. We don't always see it all. But so as you sit there by someone today, their tent, your tent, we're all a tent, all right? So, but we're all indwelt. The, the beautiful thing is that God sent a tent, and it was indwelt by himself, by his son, by his glory, all right? We live in this tabernacle, as the apostle said, it's dissolving. It's faint, it's weak, it can be blown over in a storm, all right? We, can, we, we face difficulty. But Jesus Christ, God sends him from time and eternity. He takes on this tent, this human form. He becomes himself this, this dwelling place, and he puts his tent among us here. Now, there, there's a corresponding word for those who love to do word studies, as you know I do. But there's a, a corresponding word. We talk about what that word tent in the Greek is. The corresponding word for that to dwell among us is the word sekon in the Hebrew language. And it was used to speak in the Hebrew language of a dwelling place. It's used in regard to Israel, how God would dwell among his people and take residence among his people. Exodus 25, Exodus 29. There's a passage in Zechariah chapter 2 that talks about how God would tabernacle with his people. And it's the word miskan. That's the word for tabernacle. But the word dwell is the word sekan. Now, there's, there's a term which is popular in church circles today. We, we use the word Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God, all right? Shekinah. It's Shekinah in Texas, all right? In, in Hebrew, it's more like Shekinah. But it's, it's this word we use, and we talk about it's the presence of God. It's the manifest glory of God. That word is really not a, an Old Testament Hebrew word. It's kind of a post-biblical word that was, that was developed in, in time. And it was taken from the two words, the word sekam, meaning to dwell, and the word miskan, meaning the tent. And those two words were put together, at Shekinah, which literally the word itself in, in the modern language means residence, all right? But that's exactly what the Lord did. He, he took up residence here. You know, he came into to this world. The Bible says he came to his own, even though his own received not. He was there in their midst. So the Lord literally takes up residence here. You see him doing that in the Old Testament, again, with the tabernacle. Remember, they would move from place to place, tear down the tabernacle, rebuild the tabernacle, put it back up, and then the Lord would rest over the tabernacle. He would take up a residence there. It was, a, it was the manifestation. And that's, when we talk about Shekinah, well, that means the glory of God. Well, it's literally the, this word has to do with presenting you know, himself. He's manifesting himself. He's showing his people in the Old Testament with the tabernacle that he's in their midst. And they would see that cloud by day and the fire by night. In later on in the history of Israel, when the temple is built, the Bible says that this glory of God came over and rested over the temple. So much at the dedication of the temple, everybody had to vacate. They couldn't, this couldn't handle being in the, the very presence of holy God. But here is the Lord, the Lord of glory, in his glorious presence, he comes down and he becomes this Shekinah, this, this, this ultimate manifestation of God in our midst. If you look at Jesus, what did Jesus tell Peter, uh, Philip? When Philip said, Lord, you know, we don't know the way. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no man comes to the Father but by me. He said, well, you know, uh, how do we know the way? He said, if any man has seen me, he's seen the Father. No, I in your midst and God. This is, I am resident in your midst. You see the Father, you see me, you see me, you see the Father. I'm all here. So the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That he pitches his tent. And the day that Jesus was born in Bethlehem was the day that that tent was pitched on the earth. And he stayed in that tent until the cross. And then even after the cross, he raises up that tent in a glorified body and he meets with the disciples for 40 days. He's off and on with different meetings of the church, all right? And then he ascends to the Father. And that's when the angel said, that same Jesus, that, that tabernacle there <laughs> that's filled with the presence and the glory of God, that same Jesus shall return in like manner. And that's what we've been talking about in the last several weeks, how the Lord of glory will return. But John says, you know, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he says, and then we beheld his glory. His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He gives us a little more insight than just say that God 
manifest himself in Jesus Christ. He's, he, he, he's given us a little more clarity about this God-man and this man-God. I've heard preachers say this before, and maybe you've heard them say it too. Well, when the Lord of glory came from heaven to earth, he laid aside his glory and took on human form. I have a theological word for that, hogwash. <laughs> and this is exactly what John is saying. John is saying, we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, and he was full of grace and full of truth. In other words, and, and these words are important, and we'll look at them in just a second, but what, what this really means. But ultimately saying, he came in human form, but he was still God. He was filled with the glory of God. He's God in our midst. And John makes this, this statement over throughout in, in the scriptures, you know, and later in the book of Revelation, and even in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he's talking about any man that confess that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the God is God in the flesh, he said, you know, is a liar, and, and he's the Antichrist. This is the spirit of Antichrist. So this is foundational to our Christian belief and what we trust and what we, we know to be true of God and his word that God became a man and he tabernacled among us and then he, he was full of truth, he was full of grace. Now, that word terminology is pretty simple. It says full. It's literally what it means. He was full. In other words, there's no room for any, any, any more. In other words, he's absolutely God in the flesh. He's full. I mean, you can take this cup, and you can continue to fill this glass, and you can fill it to where it's full, which means it's about to spill over. All right? That's when it's really full. Some people say, are you the glass half full guy? The glass half full guy. When it comes to Jesus, it's the glass completely full. All right? <laughs> He's completely God in the flesh. And this is where there's, there's a lot of theology that comes pouring out of this when we start talking about the impeccability of Christ. Which, which, what does that mean? That means he's really, truly, completely God, but he's in the flesh, all right? That he has, he's taken on human form. And it's important that we understand that because he's the only one, ultimately, that was good enough and clean enough and pure enough to be a sacrifice for sin. The wages of sin is death. We are tainted. You say, well, I'll die for my own sin. Well, that's, you'll just spend eternity dying because you, you're not sufficient. You, you, can't, you can't make yourself good enough. And there's a lot of people struggling with that. A lot of people, they, they sit in church even. They, they go to church. They try to be good. They try to be honorable. They try to be people of good character and have integrity in their life. And somehow they think that in their mind, that's what, it, that's what it's going to take to get them to heaven. And that's a frustrating way to live your life. You need to come to grips with the fact that you're a sinner and you need to be saved. And the only way you can be saved is by God's grace. You've not done anything to deserve that. Even though you might have tried to be a better person, try to, try to be more righteous, all that just comes out of ourself. And the flesh and the self is, is tainted with the sin nature. And so God comes in his mercy, is full of grace and he's full of truth to pay this ultimate price for us. So God did not limit himself, and Jesus is not limited. Even in his human form, Jesus could have done anything. And you saw the miraculous things that he did do. But even everything he did do miraculously, he really says, I don't even do it myself. I'm trusting the Father. Yeah. In other words, as God, as man, he still lived the life that he's called us to have, the life of faith, trusting his heavenly Father. He said, the words that I speak, they're not my own words. I read the Gospel of John later on. He'll tell you this. The things that I do, these are the things that my Father does. I just see what he does, and I do that, and I hear what he says, and I speak that. What's he saying? I'm living by faith. Yes. Now, when we get into the first of next year, the first series we'll get into on that first Sunday of the year is that what, it, what does it really mean to live by faith? Like Jesus lived by faith. What does that really mean? For those of you who've been going through our lift study with Experience in God, this, this will just spin off that. So you, you're going to be more ready than some, all right, <laughs> when we get into that study. But it's important that we learn to, to understand this. Here's Jesus, full of God, but he still relies and relies in everything he does upon his heavenly Father. He is full, though, of grace, and he's full of truth. There's not any room for any more. Jesus Christ brought all his deity with him full of grace, full of truth. When he came down here, he was God, yet man. So understand that. You say, I don't know if I can. Well, I'm having trouble with most of the time in my life with these kind of things anyway, but I take it by faith, all right? Some things we'll probably never be able to wrap our hands around, but this is one we take in faith. That, well, I do believe with all my heart that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. And I believe what the Word of God says about the living Word of God. Remember in Scripture that the Lord came down in the Old Testament, as we talked about earlier, and he came down in a cloud, remember, on Mount Sinai. And he stood there with Moses, and the Lord declared to Moses, I'm the Lord. 
And he speaks to Moses from that, from that glorious cloud and the lightning and the fire and the cloud, all that. And here's what it says in Exodus 34, verse 5 and 7. It says, the Lord, this is the Lord speaking, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Even in the Old Testament, God's revealing himself as full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And that's what he's saying even in Exodus. There's two words, and we translate them maybe differently, like faithfulness sometimes or love sometimes. But the word, two words used in that passage in Exodus is the one word is the word has said. H-E-S-E-D is how we would spell it in the English language. Has said. And it's the word which you most times translated in the scripture as steadfast love. When the Bible talks about and David talks about the steadfast love of the Lord, that's the word, it's the word has said. It's sometimes translated different ways, but it's a crucial word meaning covenant love, sometimes translated mercy, sometimes translated grace, but it's this important word which describes the glory of God. And it reveals his glory. The other word here he talks about is, is truth. So we deal with this word has said, compassionate, love, mercy, you know, uh, gracious, covenant love, God. And it's combined with this other word that he is this, but he's also the word in the Hebrews, emet, E-M-E-T, emet. And it's the word which we use for truth. And it's also sometimes translated the faithfulness of God. It's the graciousness of God. So here's God who reveals himself in the Old Testament is grace and truth. And now in the New Testament reveals himself. With, with, he's full of grace and he's full of truth. So this Old Testament God now manifests himself through his son in Jesus Christ in human form as compassionate, mercy, covenant, love, and truth and faithfulness. That, that pair of words, truth and faithfulness, or, or truth and mercy, or, or you know, those two words translated different, they show up in a lot of places in the Old Testament is way of God's revealing what he's like and who he is to all of us. And now God sends his son, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, and he's full of grace and he's full of truth. The glory of God. That's basically what we're talking about here. When Moses stood before the Lord and the Lord passed before him and put him in the cleft of the rock, God's glory was manifest there. And Moses is hiding in the cleft of the rock, and God walks by displaying this graciousness, this, this, this truthfulness, this ineffable grace, and this ineffable truth. It, it, but this is the same glory now that, that John is saying, we witnessed it, we beheld him. This is the same God of eternity that's now been revealed through Jesus Christ. This is the Word made flesh to us. Well, what a tremendous passage of Scripture. Just, just a little brief pause and, and, and phrase in the Word of God sometimes can be easily overlooked. I mean, just don't take a moment to look over and say, what is really being said here? That we beheld the glory of the Father, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. What's he saying? This is God and literally is Emmanuel, God with us. Now, we have this understanding. That's why. Because we have the written Word. We have this written Word, and this written Word reveals to us the living Word. And praise God for his Holy Spirit's ministry in our hearts and lives that convicts us based upon what God's word teaches us and we can respond and learn more of who our living word is. Because the Bible tells us even this word is not a dead book. This is the living word of God. This is not like any book you have in your house. You may have some pretty smart books in your house. All right. You may have all the encyclopedias. You may have it in computer form. Your smartphone may be real smart. It's not this smart. All right. This is the real living Word of God. This is the Word of God that transforms and changes lives. Jesus informs us that himself as the living Word just how important his words are. Because in Matthew chapter 7, he's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the flood came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. What's the rock? The Word. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Two builders. Probably building the same kind of house, same look from the outside, only one thing different, what they built upon. Now, 
it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out the Lord's talking about our lives and what we do with our lives and how we fashion our lives and what, we, what, we, what our principles are and what our philosophy is or what our theology is. That, this, everybody builds a house. But what are you building your house on? Jesus says this wise man built his house upon a foundation. And he said that foundation is the word. The word. Which ultimately means Jesus himself. Are you following Christ? Have you built your life on his word? Do you follow his word? Do you hear what he says? Do you obey what he says? Are you building on the right foundation? Are you just kind of saying, well, I believe the Bible, but you don't really commit to the Bible. You don't commit your heart to the Bible. You don't commit your ways to what the Bible says about your life, your direction, your habits, your lifestyle, your speech. Oh, you know, that's important stuff, but, you know, I'm just going to do things my own way. The Bible says that's foolish. Amen. It's interesting to note about both of these. Not only they were both built, but they were both tested by the storms. Please listen to me. Sometimes as Christians, you might get a little upset because storms are coming. Trials come, difficulty comes, wind comes, rain comes, and the storms come, and the floods. But now understand, it happens to both. The Bible says God will cause it to rain on the just as well as the unjust. We're living in a world. It's amazing to me as we live in this world, how, how God gets such a bad rap for everything bad that goes on. You know, you ever heard of that? What do people ask you a lot of times? Well, if, I know you believe in God, but if God's so good and God is so loving, and how could he allow that to happen? God didn't allow that. We did. Adam and Eve opened the door to sin in the Garden of Eden, and we've all become sinners by nature ever since then, and we continue to open the door to every kind of unbelief, every kind of godlessness, every kind of idolatry, every kind of immor immorality. We open those doors in our world, and we want to blame God. God sent an answer for that, his son. Amen. And as long as we're in this world, Jesus said, while you're in this world, there will be tribulation yes. and even persecution for those who choose to really follow me and love me. But be of good cheer. Excuse me, I've mean, I got storms. <laughs> i got these hassles. You know, my dog doesn't lean like me. So what do you mean, be of good cheer? I have overcome the world. Amen. Listen, this life you live right now is so short, so temporal, so brief, David the psalmist said, my life is like a hand breath before me. What is a hand breath? Do you feel that go by your face when you do that? That's a hand breath. Just, just a little wisp of wind. He said, like a flower that appears in the field for a moment and it's gone. Life is short. Eternity is forever. But what we do right here with what God's given us as these little tabernacles is so important that we build our life upon the rock and not upon sand, that we believe his word, we trust in him, and we understand that he is the living word. So I'm not following a manual of religion here. I'm following him. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my King. He's also my friend, and he's my brother. Amen. I have a relationship here, all right? And you know, I know we're living in a world people like to drop names. Let me drop the biggest one, Jesus. Yeah. I know Jesus. You know so-and-so. You know the state representative. Good for you. You know the mayor. You know the councilman. You know the chief of police. Great, great. I know Jesus, son of God. Yeah. You can't get any bigger than that. Amen? Yeah. We build our lives not upon some religious principle. We build our life on the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we do not, then we have nothing to look forward to but failure after failure. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who needs not to be ashamed because you have done what? You've rightly handled the word of truth. So we handle the word of truth. We're handling not only this word. How do you handle that? You, you read it and obey it. But we're handling, really, when we do business here, we're doing business with our Savior. God lives on these pages. This isn't a dead book. This isn't another just book of, of reference and religion. These words are living words. When you open your Bible, you're going to discover the very presence of God making these things known to your inner heart. Things that you didn't comprehend or understand before become understandable. God makes himself known. This is a spiritual book, and it requires spiritual eyes to see it. How do you get spiritual eyes? You give your heart to Christ. You're born anew, the Bible says, and you receive the capacity to read and understand God's truth in God's word. That's the beauty of, of, of Christmas, by the way. Right? That's all part of the gift of God's grace and God's love and God's mercy and Christmas. And boy, any season that Christians ought to be excited about, it certainly ought to be Christmas season when we celebrate the word of God becoming flesh and dwelling among us and pitching his tent in our midst that we might meet face to face with him and have his real experience of life and fellowship and love in our own hearts and in our own life. The word, 
think about this. Here we have this living word. It's this word of God. It's alive, quick, powerful, the Bible says. And then we have the revelation of the true word, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was from everlasting to everlasting, the ancient of days. We get a picture of the true word, and then we have an understanding. Say, hey, I need that word. I need that life. I need that change to change me. Jesus put it this way when he's telling Nicodemus, very religious man, he was asking him how we get to heaven, and Jesus basically tells him, you can't do it yourself. You have to be born again. Now, how do we get born again? Do I join the church? Do I get baptized, sprinkled? Confirmed? None of that borns me again. In fact, I can't born myself again anymore, and I born myself the first time. <laughs> you had nothing to do with the first one, did you? You were just a screaming little baby. You couldn't walk, you couldn't talk, you did nothing but make a mess. Amen. Parents say amen. amen. <laughs> Someone else had something to do with your creation. Someone else also has to have something to do with your recreation. You have to come to God, present yourself to him, believe, put your faith and your trust in him, and the Bible says you receive his word and you're made new. That's the power of the living word and the written word of God. When I put my trust in him, he changes me. He changes my life. Let me, let me just give you a quick little list of just a few things of the power of the word of God. And you can write these scriptures down and look them up later for your own study. But in Psalms 107, 20, he talks about how the word of God came and it was sent forth and it delivered people and it healed people. That's the power of God's word to literally change our life. In John 8, 32, maybe you know the passage. The Bible says you know the truth the word, and the truth will make you free. Psalm 119 said he, he sends his word and it illuminates us and it gives us light. When you're in a place in your life and it seems dark and you need direction, you, where do you go? You need to go to the word of God. And you need to find a place there in the word of God and let God speak to you. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that hearing, that the faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So how am I going to grow in my faith? The word of God. I'm going to have to take God's word seriously, not only as the person, Jesus, but also as what he's revealed to us in the written word of God and become familiar with what God says in the truth of scripture. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that not only is it able to do a lot of things in life, it says also able to make one wise. That's helpful, amen? amen. <laughs> that God's word brings wisdom. That's one thing that there's a tremendous lack of in the culture we live in. And if we're honest in our own lives, we see a lack of it. And we don't know what to do in different situations. But here's the beautiful thing. Because of my relationship with God and my understanding now of his word, he'll give me wisdom. He'll give me insight. He'll give me clarity. And I'll begin to understand and to know what it is that God wants. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 4, 2, that the word of God is, is, is there so that it will encourage, exhort, it'll rebuke and reprove. But the thing about it is God's saying, I'm using my word to give you instruction and to exhort you, to encourage you, to lift you up and give you the light you need. John, Jeremiah was talking about the word of God and he said, it, it rejoices the heart of those who behold it and those who receive it, that it brings joy and it brings blessing. In fact, it says it brings a joy and a delight to those who read it. What about this? Where am I going to get joy and delight? I'm going to get it from the Word of God if I spend time with the Word of God. James 1 talks about that we, we, we've been regenerated. We've been brought forth. We have this new life in Jesus as Christians. What makes us Christians is this now, it's the Word of God that has brought us forth. The Bible talks about how the disciples would teach and use the Word of God to teach and instruct people. Where do you get real teaching from? The Word of God. Again, back to Psalms. If you read through Psalms 119, there's multiple verses throughout Psalms 119 that talk about just what the Word of God does, what the Word of God is, and that literally transforms us even to the point of changing what's going on in your heart and in your mind. He, he will bring joy in your life. You want to know how to live your life? The Bible tells us in Titus 2.25 that this is the standard of conduct. This is the Word of God, and He teaches us what is right, what is holy, how to live, how to walk. Excuse me how to talk. Yes. The Word of God brings that kind of light and that kind of instruction. It is the very source of where our new life comes from. The Bible says we've been born now of an imperishable seed of the Word of God. There was a seed that was planted when you were born the first time. Now the Holy Spirit comes and plants the seed of the Word of God in your heart and you trust and believe Him. And what happens? It brings forth life. You're born anew. You're made a brand new person. Your essence for living 
The strength you'll find for your daily life is going to be found in the Word of God. It's referred to as meat in one place. It's referred to as the milk of God's Word. In fact, it's called the sincere milk of the Word of God. In other words, it is truth and it is grace. It is exactly what you need to grow you spiritually. It's what sustains us. And Isaiah, as Isaiah speaks about the Word of God, this is the nutrition. James, uh, Job put it this way. He said, Lord, I have esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. Think about that. No, I'm seriously, think about it. <laughs> I have esteemed, in other words, I think, God, that your word is more important than breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Amen. Now, just a moment here. I like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I really have an affinity for those kind of things, all right? I, I, like, I like food. Anybody else? Am I the only one? I mean, I'm probably showing a lot of it. I enjoy food, good food, all right? Bad food, not so much. But I really like eating. And I can tell, never mind, I won't go there. <laughs> but catch, catch what Job's saying. He says, I need your word more than I need to eat. In fact, he says, I have put it on the shelf higher than food. Where's it on your, on your shelf? It, and listen, it hadn't even got much higher than food on a lot of folks. It hadn't even got past what they do with any other thing in their life. All right? Some hadn't put it before potty time. All right? They just don't spend time with God's Word. They, I mean, they know they should if they're a Christian because God puts that in your heart, plus it's all th throughout the Scripture. But what value have I truly placed upon God's Word. Just how important is it in my life? Just how dependent? And I really believe that's the reason so many Christians walk around struggling and suffering in their Christian life and filled with doubt and confusion and a misunderstanding and, and just don't, can't get a grip on their life or what's going, God doing in their life or what God's will is or, you know, how do I deal with this problem? Why do I keep falling in that sin? Why, why can't I get... You know, a lot of it boils right down to this. Everybody I've ever talked to and counseled with, it usually comes back to this. I ask them, how are you and the Word of God doing? How much time do you spend with the Word of God? Do you really have a time uh, you really spend with God in His Word? Well, I, I, I no. No. Do you have a dedicated, committed time? Whether it's morning, lunch, evening, or But is there time, uh, you know, and I'm not going to get into the, and try to be legalistic. Well, it has to be at 5.30 in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Whatever. No. Is there a time? I don't care when it is. That's between you and God. And it should be a time when you're most clear-headed, all right? So if you, if you have to get up and walk around the block first, go do it, all right? But the time in God's Word to hear from God, to let God speak to you, you know, and, and really just between you and, and, and your Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's presence, that you're taking time to open up the Word of God and let God speak to your heart. Amen. So few Christians do that. In fact, it's incredibly amazing how few people do that in the world today. You say, well, brother, how often do you think I should read the Word of God? I think the Bible implies this with much clarity. It's a daily deal. Amen. It's a daily deal. In fact, it's, it's pretty well written. If you spend 15 minutes a day in the Bible, you can read it through in one year. 15 minutes! <laughs> he agreed, and he's not even back there. <laughs> 15 minutes! That's nothing. Really, is it? I mean, 15 minutes. Seriously. What would it take to give the Lord 10 to 15 minutes just in his word? Just to open up the scripture and just to read the word of God through. It'll transform your life supernaturally. You'll begin to have answers that you didn't have before. You'll have wisdom you didn't have before. You'll have clarity you didn't have before. You'll have direction you didn't have before. You'll have understanding you didn't have before. Right. And it could well be, if you're just doing that on a regular basis, that you're going to face something 90 days from now that God will speak to you about even today. And your heart will be ready when you get 90 days down the road. Well, you have no idea what's coming. But he does. Because yes. he's God from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. All right? And he's given us. And this is why Job says that. I think it's more important for me to hear you speak, get some time with you in your word, than anything I might eat today. Yes. Those are, that's a strong passage of Scripture. But, you know, the Bible really makes it pretty clear to us when the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word. You know, that's not like an option. That's a command. 
You know, that's, that's what God, there's the God said, you do this. And here's the beautiful thing about all these promises of God. They, most all of them start with this two-letter word, if. You know, if. God says, I will do this, I will do this, I'll bless you, I'll, you know, I'll restore you, I'll do this. I'll do this. If. Just come to me, ask me, seek me. Have not because you ask not. You won't spend time with me. Now, I'm believing that 2020 for our church will be, it will be just what it is, a, a 2020 vision of who God is, what God's doing, where God's leading, what God's saying. Not just only as a church, but as individuals. And the way to experience that in your life is going to be in the Word of God and through the Word of God. You know, some of you have been members around here as long as I have, all right? You, you were here from the beginning. You know how important it is and how often I instruct and teach and preach and scream and, and whisper, be in the Word, be in the Word, be in the Word. Because this is where your answers are. It's where your life is. You know, we, we've encouraged the church. Get past this right quick. At the beginning of this year, whoops, back up. What, seven months ago, six months ago, maybe farther back, we started mentioning that, I think we mentioned even in September of last year before we got to 2019 and 2018 when I met with the leaders of the church that in 2020 I was going to challenge the church to read through the Bible together as a body. We'd all be reading through the scriptures together. And that I really had a heart for us to do it using a chronological Bible. Now, a chronological Bible is not any different than a regular Bible except the way the order of the passages and the order of the books, all right? And they literally are placed in the scripture in the order in which they were written in time. All right, Corinthians was written before the Gospel of John. Do you know that? So they're written, so the Bible is put together in chronological order. Now we have it more of like a logical order with the Gospels here and the Paul's letters here, and, you know, it's, it's the, the prophets and the minor prophets. There's more of a chronological, logical, uh, not chronological, but a logical laying out of it. But the chronological Bible, uh, theologians have gone back, taken it's just the Word of God. This is a new King James version of it. It's just the Word of God. It's getting it, d- given to us in English, and it's placed in chronological order. In other words, if you're reading something perhaps in Kings uh, or, or in Chronicles, There'll also be some Psalms that David wrote regarding that event that's taking place in King's. So those scripture passages will be brought into that chronological order of things. So it's kind of like reading a novel (laughs) as it's been given to us. The revelation has been given to us from God. Now, you know, those who've been around for a while, if you're a guest of ours today, you don't have this. There'll be new information for you. But I'd encourage you to do this to get a chronological Bible. Now, we made them available. We had some for sale. I think we're out now. Uh, we got from our, from our bookstore distributor that we use, but it's pretty much the same price. If you go on Amazon or CBD or any of them, they're all about $15 to $19 in that range. You, you can get one there. If you order it, you can get it soon. You can get it in Kindle form. You can go to Amazon or one of the uh, bookstore places and get the chronological Bible in, in Kindle form. If you have a smartphone and you're smart enough to run your smartphone, some of your phones are smarter than you are, I know. Uh, me too. But anyway, I do know enough how to, to use it to read my Bible. There's an there's a app called YouVersion. I'm sure some of the other Bible apps have it as well. There's an app called YouVerse. And you can download YouVerse. And you can go to the daily Bible readings. It has some plans and suggested plans in there. So when you go to the tab that after you download it, it says daily Bible readings. Click that. And then it comes up these different options. If you scroll down enough, you'll see one there that says chronological Bible. Now, I don't think it's the actual same publisher, but it's the same chronological order, all right? And it lays it out where it takes you about 10 to 15 minutes a day to do that daily Bible reading, depending on your speed of reading. And, you know, you may want to take a little more time with it and look at it a little closer, but it'll just lay it out to you in chronological order. We have challenged our church, both campuses, to go through the chronological Bible starting January 1st together. I am praying that you'll get on board. If you didn't buy one, go to the phone, go to the app, whatever, get one to go down the uh, well, Lifeway close. You can get online with Lifeway and get it there, but you can get it before January 1st if you don't delay, Amen. which is usually the problem with a lot of Christians. Get the chronological Bible. Get this. If you just don't feel led to do that, then just open up to Genesis chapter 1 and start reading every day about 15 minutes. You'll get through the whole thing. Amen? And every part of the Word of God, by the way, is the Word of God. Even what I call the begets. Y'all know what the begets are, don't you? It's those long chapters where so-and-so begets so-and-so, and he begets so-and-so, who begets so-and-so, and they beget so-and-so, and they had two sons that beget so-and-so and so-and-so, and they beget, and on and on it goes. Y'all familiar with the begets? Some of y'all just skipped on. But even the begets, you'll find out how important they are because they tell the history 
of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they're there, and that's why they're so important, to show that Jesus truly was born of the house of David. Amen. So the begats are important. But get it, read it, it will transform your daily walk, your daily life. And I believe by the end of the year, you will have grown, you will have matured, you will increase in knowledge as well as wisdom, because that is exactly what the Word of God will do. And as you do that, encourage others to do that. You say, Brother Joe, I was reading along about day four. I, I, I dropped it. Hey, get back in on day five. Just pick it up and go. All right? If you have time, go back and read what you missed, but just keep going. If you fall down, the Bible says a righteous man will fall down seven times and get back up. All right? In other words, we don't quit even though we failed, even though we flustered, even though we might have blown it. We get back up and we keep walking with God. Amen? That's who you are. So be that individual and do something that's going to make a difference eternally in your life. And it will transform your heart. It'll transform your walk. It'll transform your life. But nobody can make you do these things, all right? You are the one who has to do what needs to be done. Only you can do it. You can't trust that Kathy reading is not going to be good for me reading it, all right? She needs to read it. I need to read it. And the beautiful thing about smartphones, even though they can be a little bit unchristian, in the Bible app, they're pretty Christian, is that not only can you read it, then while you're driving home, you can put your headphones on and listen to it back. Again, that's just great. God gave us that for that reason. Everybody else uses it for some other reason, all right? But listen, we have this opportunity, and I believe what's going to happen, number one, individually, you're going to grow in grace. Two, collectively, the church will grow in grace. Three, I guarantee you, even though we've had people coming to Christ and getting back, we'll see more of that, more so multiplied even greater because we're being faithful to God and we're being faithful to his word. And as we go and as we receive, I don't know about you, you got to tell somebody what God said to you. You got to tell somebody what God's doing in your life. And even people, they'll, they'll see the difference in your life. They'll say, what's going on with you? Say, man, I've just made a commitment to read the word of God. You did what? And there's your opportunity to share Christ with them. Man, get in God's word. It is transformative in its very nature to change your life. The Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of mercy, full of grace, full of truth. Now we want to behold that in our lives, and this is the avenue which God has given us. Thank God for the birth of the living Word, and thank God that He's given us this written Word that is also alive, and He will communicate that to, heart, to our hearts through the Holy Spirit and transform us on a daily basis and a greater basis. There's a word of warning. You, you know, you've seen the warning labels the government puts on everything? This is hazardous to your old life. <laughs> All right. It's hazardous to your old life. You'll find yourself wanting to put that behind you, take it to the cross, and walk with Jesus. Hallelujah. So, if you're on board, especially members I'm talking to, and you're going to listen to what your pastor say and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be on board. I'm going to read through the Bible with this next year. We're going to get together on this. How many can say amen to that? Amen. 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 I didn't hear that. Amen. amen. God's good and he's been good to us. I'm not going to give a formal invitation today. I really believe, uh, and almost every Sunday we do that, but I really believe that today is a day that we need to be challenged to be in the Word of God and then just go do it. Amen. So make a note. If somebody wants to know what you want for Christmas, say, I want a chronological Bible. Yeah. Let them buy it. <laughs> Amen. Amen? And be on board. The thing I do want to bring forth to you before Gary comes to give us some final announcements about our services and events that are coming up very, future, uh, very soon in the future is one that I want to tell you about, I mentioned briefly, uh, is our, our Christmas offering. And this is, remember, let me just tell you about, for somebody who may not be familiar with our Christmas offering, in our general budget in our church, we give to missions. We give to the Southern Baptist Convention. We give to state conventions. We give to local associations, San Felipe Baptist Association. We participate in missions in a, in a, in a statewide, local-wide, and national way, and international way as well through the IMB and the Southern Baptist Convention. We give money through our, general, uh, through our general budget. But every year at Christmas, we take up a very special offering, all right? And I think Christmas is the most appropriate time to do a missions offering because Jesus Christ came to the world to seek and save that which was lost, all right? And he's left us with his commitment to reach the world. This Christmas offering is specifically used in offering and emissions that we are hands-on with, things that we do as a church. Yes, more of the others sending 
This is more of us doing things, whether it's our pastor's conferences in, 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 uh, in Belize and now in Cuba as well with support of churches in different areas of the world. This is something that we all give to beyond, above what we normally give to our uh, to just to our regular tithes and offerings. And I have some pictures up here that are pictures from some of the things that we've done in the past. Uh, there's pictures of us baptizing folks in Cuba. The center pictures at Orange Walk, uh, and that's where we'll be going for our, our citywide crusade in Belize next spring break. Money that comes in, this portion that goes in to support that crusade. Some of these pictures are from the pastor's conference in Cuba. Some are from the pastor's conferences in Belize. But uh, some are from different rallies we've held. We've been invited back to do a, 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 a a, a national rally or a national revival in some regard. But all this is stuff that comes from the Christmas offering that we receive every year. This wouldn't happen without that. This is, this is a commitment that takes place in ministering on a very personal basis. Uh, this part of our, as we say, our, our, our trip uh, that we take, anybody that wants to go in the church can go and participate in these missions like we do in Belize with the crusade this year at spring break season. Uh, other things that, that support it are the different ventures that we do in helping pastors. Uh, we're working now with a, with a ministry that works deeply in Cuba. It helps establish churches. We've talked about resulting, depending on the result of the offering for the Christmas, how many churches can we support new churches? And remember, Cuba is a communist country, so they're not allowed to build churches. All right. So what they do is very clever. They just start churches in their homes. In fact, when we've gone to buildings that look like churches, there's no signage on them. Some of these smaller communities, right? There's, there'll be a building there, and there's no signage on it. But when you go in, the first thing you see is the sign and the name of the church. They won't put it on the outside. God, it's against the law to build a church. And some of those have gotten away with it. It's many times when the government finds them, they just tear them down. So what a lot of, past, what a lot, a lot of the church growth is happening where these guys surrender to the Lord and to ministry. They go through a couple years of education, just basic Bible theology, and they become... Uh, we would just call them pastors of churches. They become missionaries over a mission, all right? And terminology is important in communist countries. So they become missionaries. They're really pastors. Missionary, the mission is, is the church. It's in their home. These guys will get a house. They'll gut out most of it as they can. They'll leave a room or two for their family in the little kitchen area, and the rest of the house is just open up, and they bring in chairs. Sometimes it goes outside the house, and there's covered awning areas. Sometimes it goes into to, to, to the, the living rooms, and they eventually kind of have a little corner. Of, they don't have a lot of privacy in their life. You know, uh, One pastor we met with, that uh, he, he said, my, my, my house is open 24 hours a day. He said, the back, back here is where we have church. He said, and it just opened up the rest of the house. He said, but the people can come in the back door and then come in and pray if they want to. But if we want to really say, you know, you look around, you see the banners. We talk about reach the world and we talk about love God, love people, reach the world. This is what this is all about in a very practical sense of love God, love people and reach the world. This is important ministry that we've done for years upon years. It has only been possible. It has only been a reality. Why? Because you have given so graciously this Christmas offering every year. The Christmas, the whole heart of Christmas to me is missions. I mean, that Jesus came, the ultimate missionary, and gave himself for us. So if we, if we talk about giving gifts, I know you've sat down and you're thinking about, well, I've got to give so-and-so and so-and-so, and, so and you make your little Christmas list, right? I would hope that the very first name on your Christmas list is Jesus. It's his birthday. Yeah. <laughs> How would you like it if your birthday everybody got gifts by you, all right? <laughs> it's his birthday. What would Jesus want for his birthday? souls, lives touched, churches established, people's hearts and lives changed. That's what the Lord wants for Christmas. That's what the Lord wants every day. He's made it clear. That's the commandment we've been given. So your Christmas offering as we talk about it. I said we haven't said much about it all year, but I do want you to clearly understand that those are the elements. That's what it's all about. If you have any misunderstanding, there's clarity. Something we can do above and beyond the rest of what we do in a year. Be a part of this. And then come be on a mission trip with us. You're invited to come on any event that we ever go on, whether it's a pastor's conference, a trip, a mission trip, or whatever, you can participate. As we look in Cuba next year, we've already identified a couple places on our last trip that we could really strategically help with. One is a young pastor. I showed a picture when I came back from Cuba of two young pastors. I want to help both of them. One is a young pastor who himself walks to a village every day, five or six miles, walks to this village, and just goes door to door in the community and shares Jesus. They found now a piece of property that they've already purchased to put a home and build a church inside that home there. There's an old ratty shack there with a slab that's all beat up and busted up. I asked them to, uh, 
when we were there, the regional guy with that particular missionary said, would you find out the cost to put this home up? To not, not on this, but to put a new slab down and put another home up. Most homes like that are built on just a cement slab with concrete blocks and a few divider walls. And I said, and, and let us know. I think that the, the, I got an email from him, I think it was 10 days, two weeks ago. He, he finally got back with the, the cost. He said, the cost us to build a home, to start a church there, property's already paid for, about $3,800 in Cuba. How much does it cost to support a pastor like that? $100 a month. $100 a month. And that's, that, you say, for four, that's 4.25 4. weeks in a month, right? <laughs> that's 23-something cents dollars a week they live on. That's the average salary in Cuba. For all your friends who want to move towards socialism and communism, send them to Cuba. <laughs> Amen. I'll take them with me if you'd like. Not sure I'll bring them back, but I'll take them. No. Anyway. <laughs> that's humor, all right? If you're on live stream, that's humor, okay? I'm just that kind of guy. I'm sorry. But uh, the idea is that, you know, we don't want these guys working part-time jobs. We want them completely involved in ministry, that they're just reaching people. So depending on what happens here and how we do, let us know what we can do in supporting the conference, the pastor's conferences, the mission trip, and at least a couple churches out of this with a home built. That's what my heart's desire is. Amen? Amen. That's where it's going. That's what it'll be spent on. And I believe that's where God will receive the glory. Somebody say amen. amen. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Well, Pastor Joe and Miss Kathy say Merry Christmas to each and every one. We love you and we thank God for you. Brother Gary, come. Y'all appreciate Brother Gary? Amen. You know I Amen. do. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So yesterday we had our annual widow's luncheon, and I just would like to thank Miss Pam and her team of volunteers just for, for loving on our members. Amen. And those that were there, uh, our, our guests. And it's because of, of your just dedication and hard work and, and really just being a vessel, amen, that, that you, we were able to bless, encourage, and just honor those widows at this time. Uh, nobody asked to be a part of that group, amen. Nobody, nobody says, who, I wonder what it's like. And, and, and during, I'm sure every day, and, and, and I'm sure every day is hard and difficult, but I'm sure it's difficult around the holidays. And so I just want to thank Pam and, and again, the team just for loving them, honoring them, and encouraging them. And, 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 and the word that was, the message that was brought yesterday, I just heard raving reviews and, on how Miss Brenda did. Because she walks that life, amen. And so, Tammy, just thank your mom for being there. Because that's what we're called to do is to, to live life and to walk with people and and who else better than somebody that lives that life, amen? So just as you see Pam and her team, just thank them for just being available to, to God's word and, and, to, and to the message and, and to the vision that he has for, for that ministry, amen? Um, absolutely. Um, and speaking of that, just uh, our holiday food drive, of course, uh, last, last week I made a joke, and, and I apologize if I offended anybody. It wasn't do, do any, any, any harsh. I didn't mean any ill will on that uh, regarding, you know, uh, the, the food items that you bring. But any, anything is, is, is beneficial to, our, to, to those that are in need because, again, need is not seasonal. Need is every day. And, and, and so we also have little Debbie's in there and, and things like that. But our food basket drive really does support the food, pas the food uh, pantry upstairs so they can continue to give those that are in need. So there are, there are uh, baskets or, or, or uh, bags out there that you can pick up with food item lists that you can do. Uh, don't forget our Christmas Eve services. Uh, Magnolia is 530. Spring is at 7. Um, skip through the wreath or Bible. Pastor Joe, I don't want to uh, re redundant with that. Uh, but again, if uh, the 24th is our Christmas Eve service, it's one hour. If you got family here, hey, invite them to come. Tell them they don't get any gifts unless they come to Christmas Eve service here. It's one hour. We'll have a great time of fellowship and a great message. Amen. Uh, don't forget for our first time visitors, our welcome card. If you'll meet the pastor at the end of, at the end of the service in our in our foyer there, he'll love to greet meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Don't forget your tithes and offering. There's three ways to give that are on the screen behind me. Uh, just remember to honor the Lord as He continues to honor us. Amen. It's not our anyway. Uh, so we get to give, get to give, get to give. Amen. With that being said, don't forget our evening activities. And again, I'm, if 
I don't want to be presumptuous with the lexicon. If you're not familiar, Lift is Living in Fellowship Together. That's for our adults and our younger groups. That's a Bible study. Uh, some t- people call it life life groups. We call it Lift group. And a, and then a one is, is approved workmen are not ashamed. That's our children's ministry. Or, and, and so if you're interested in, in both of those or either of those, there's information out there. Awana starts at 515. Lift group starts at 530. With that being said, you are dismissed.